We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, dear colleagues. Um, welcome to the main session uh, devoted to emerging regulation and thank you very much for those who are online and uh, offline with us here. And so without any hesitation, uh, on behalf of our Mark Issue team, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Jovan Krubalia, our moderator of today's session. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, big, uh, big hello from, uh, as you can see from my back, from the background of the room from, uh, from, uh, from Vatican. I'm collect connecting from, uh, from the um, Eternal City and then more specifically from Vatican. And it's, uh, there is interesting, there are quite a few uh, connections. And since this morning, I attended a session on uh, uh, Interreligious dialogue. I'm attending the event which, this, uh, which is addressing the question of digital developments and interreligious dialogue. Uh, one of the echoing questions during this discussion was the question uh, how different uh, religious communities all over the world can address digitalization and artificial intelligence uh, in particular. That was the main concern. But there was one question which was echoing in discussion, and I guess we can advance that uh, that the, that discussion today with such a remarkable panelist, whom I will introduce just in a minute. The question was very simple. They were asking whom uh, they, religious people or citizens worldwide, should uh, call contact if they have digital problems, from cybersecurity to privacy, data, access to the internet. And uh, my preparation, cognitive preparation for this discussion is shaped by that dilemma. What we can do as IGF community, as people involved in internet governance policy from different communities, what we can do to answer this simple question that will be asked more and more often as we depend more and more on the, on the internet. And we are fortunate that the navigation around this question will be a, a pleasure, at least for me as a moderator, giving this remarkable uh, lineup today, which where we have uh, with us, and I would like to welcome uh, all of our guests, uh, all our distinguished guests, both in terms of their experience and expertise, but also in terms of their really important contribution to current debate, where, which we have on the future of regulation and future of the governance in general. Our session, the title of the session is Regulation and the Open Interoperable Interconnected Internet Challenges and Approaches. Therefore, you're in the right Zoom room. Let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, Margaret Vestager, um, uh, Vice President of the European Commission. There is no need to introduce uh, um, her given uh, uh, um, uh, Vice President's really prominent role in the Sorry to interrupt, to Johan, Infratech. but we, we had a, a change of our uh, high level guests uh, from the European side. So it's uh, Miss uh, uh, Mia Petra Kumpula uh, Natri, a uh, member of European Parliament. Uh, sorry. Good. Good. I'm, uh, we will have the European Union uh, points uh, 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 addressed, and it's, it's this great. I probably am probably reading uh, the old file. I'm in Vatican here. The, everything is happening on the long durée uh, over, the, over the centuries. This morning, they said they have been discussing ethics for the 20 centuries, and uh, like other churches, the people from, uh, from other denominations. I'm sorry for this, this mistake. But now I'm sure that I will get it right. Uh, we have today with us Windsurf. Again, there is no need to introduce uh, Windsurf, one of the uh, fathers of the internet, but person who, uh, in spite of his remarkable contribution to digital uh, world, is still finding the time to share his wisdom, expertise, and experience with us. Wind, thank you for uh, for joining us. I guess from Washington D.C. That's correct. Good. 
We have to uh, in the this really uh, uh, remarkably uh, remarkably diversity of speaker. We have today with us uh, Anton Gorelkin, member of uh, Parliament of Russian Federation who will bring us that parliamentarian perspective, which has been developing in the IGF. I think there is also parallel, a parallel track on the, on the parliaments. Therefore, I welcome uh, Mr. Gorelkin. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, 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 Mr. Peak from the uh, ICANN. We have uh, Maria, uh, Maria uh, Ressa. There, was, there were some shifts in the in the lineup for the panel. Therefore, I'm trying to, to organize all, uh, all uh, information that I have uh, um, uh, together. And this is in a way beauty of the IGF. With agility, people like Roman and the others can uh, adjust to this really tough time and you don't know who is going to be online, who will be, who will yeah, be joining the session. The latest session. version is in the chat. In the chat. Okay, that's great. And then we have uh, we have uh, with us uh, Carolina Aguera, University of Sant uh, 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 Anders in uh, Argentina. Therefore, I should open the chat, and I will be making sure that I pronounce uh, correctly all uh, all names. And uh, once more, apology for uh, Miss Mia Petra Kumpula, a Natri member of Parliament of uh, European Parliament. Welcome uh, to our session. And we have uh, uh, today also uh, Mrs. Nihat Dad, Executive Director of Digital Rights Foundation, coming uh, from India. And you can see this diversity of uh, views and the positions. Now, before I pass the uh, floor to uh, our uh, remarkable uh, panelists, and we have the co-director, I'm sorry, Carolina Aguera, co-director, Center for Technology and Society. I hope I didn't didn't uh, I won't make any more any confusion uh, in uh, our uh, discussion. Now, what is important to uh, to keep in mind uh, that this session is part of the process, build up process, and in discussion about strengthening of the IGF, one of the main messages has been to have uh, to move it beyond just one event. It's great to get together. I really miss Katowice meeting, uh, but it is also important to have a process, build up, to have a, a points uh, developed gradually and in a way matured for discussion. And we had a few sessions before, the, before this event. And one of the underlying message from uh, these preparatory sessions is that there are many, many mechanisms for regulation for governance in the government sector, in the private sector, in the local communities, parliaments are getting on the scene, international organizations, standardization bodies. And very often, the main challenge is how to navigate it, how to, how to get that answer to the call which I, which I was hearing this morning from the people from religious communities. Uh, this robustness of this approach is that it is, uh, it is basically approach to governance from diverse, uh, we can say, diverse uh, uh, geometry. In some issues, you have uh, laws, you have uh, um, so-called hard laws adopted by parliaments, and we'll be hearing from parliamentarians about that. In some cases, you have the, the best practices developed by uh, businesses, uh, which, are pro which are providing quite a great uh, and remarkable results. Therefore, that diversity is both a uh, great strength of the internet governance and digital governance in general, and internet uh, governance forum in particular. But as it always goes in life, uh, with the strength, you get also weakness. And this was, I would say, an echoing team, how to get it right, both nurturing the strength of the this very diverse space but also addressing some justified concerns, how to navigate that. That was one of the echoing themes from the preparatory uh, process. Now, with that, let's say a canvas having in mind, let's go, let's do, uh, dive uh, deeper on the three areas that we are going to cover today, where we are trying to see what is happening in the field of the internet and digital governance. And those Three areas are data, 
content and AI. Let's put them as uh, vertical, and then we'll try to make horizontal connecting points about best practices, about the way how some of these issues are are uh, are covered uh, covered in this this process. Now, without uh, without uh, further further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Miss Miapeta Kumpulu Natri from European Parliament. Uh, to tell us uh, uh, something from her experience and expertise, possibly uh, reflecting also on data, because this is what is happening in the European Union, the question of data governance and around GDPR, but also other initiatives. But I would leave up to you to navigate your reflection uh, in this broader context, how to nurture this diversity, but in the same time to have some sort of easy entry points, especially for the small and developing countries. Over to you. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. Do you hear me well? I hear you perfectly. Yes, it's clear. Good. Hey. So, hyvää päivää, good on, bonjour, odjim priatna. Greetings from the European Parliament. Uh, and I really got to know the very short notice to come here, but I'm very happy as I am being participating on the Parliament delegation to IGF in Guadalajara and Paris. And I was planning to come this time, so you gave me opportunity uh, now, and I only now get to know that it was even to replace uh, uh, Honest uh, uh, the Vestager. So I'm, uh, I'm always uh, taking two big uh, boots now. But uh, let me have my short remark as there are so good speakers uh, to come and, and I have had opportunity to a little bit watch what you've been doing here, but not, not everything yet. So to regulate or not, uh, some worries exist and that's why I think that the democratic control cannot be forgotten. Data. For the data, the interoperability is the precondition for the reusability of the data. Without data interoperability, there, we cannot make maximum of the use of promise of the data, economy and data society. Data interoperability does, however, not mean that all the data should be created according to the same standards from the beginning. That would be nonsense. New online services are constantly intervened for the new usages. Innovators will need to create data models and formats for this purpose. Imposing a common in interoperability standard through regulation at the data level should therefore only be considered in situation when there's a true lock-in or competition problem. For these ca other cases, market-driven solutions can work well. There are many service providers out there that can make data interoperable when there is a need. One piece of legislation in the interoperability uh, of the data in Europe is the Data Governance Act, where we reached a political agreement last week. I was one member of the parliament negotiation team. Data Governance Act established a framework for the common European data spaces, architecture, and data sharing intermediators that support data flows between online services and systems. It is important to look how we get the, uh, how gets to decide on the interoperability standards. In the DGA, uh, the Governance Act, we have so-called Data Innovation Board that advises and assists the Commission on defining the interoperability principles. Like internet, it is multi-stakeholder initiative. It includes members from industry, research, academia, civil society, standardization organizations, and relevant European data spaces and other uh, relevant stakeholders. So one of the tasks of this board is also to propose guidelines for the standards for the common European data spaces, meaning purpose or sector-specific or cross-sectoral interoperable frameworks of common standards and practices. The concept of the data spaces is the key for the European strategy to create trustworthy market for data. Uh, we will also in the EU budget to support creation of such data spaces in the future. There are estimations that 80% of the data in Europe is not unleashed for its potential and use. 
So unleashing it at the same time and then creating ecosystem of trust is a key. The second part of the data question is of course a protection. We want to make data economy that is trustworthy, human-centric and transparent. In the terms of the personal data, the crown jewel is of course the GDPR that has actually become an example for all over the world from USA to China. It's now debated. It. There are different initiatives and it's actually uh, one of the competitive factors. The companies want to say how uh, trustworthy they are for handling for the private data. Individual using online service should be in principle be able to take their data under the GDPR's portability right and allow other service provider to make use of that. We all know that this is not a reality today, and it would be a true as it would be if the internet would be truly open and distributed. But today, internet is not uh, that distributed place, but more and more centralized to the last uh, large platforms. For that question, e has, EU has been active in rebalancing the rights and responsibilities, the power and pala balancing uh, obligations on the, uh, with the regulation DSA, DMA are ongoing. I will not dig deeper to those now I, as I was asked to talk about data. But um, I'm from Finland and, in, and, and it has been a lot of uh, active uh, people from Finland in the My Data movement which actually uh, uh, is now a global movement and uh, with the many hubs around the world. This movement supports the idea that individuals should have uh, practical tools to make their data from one server to another. This is actually also important for the companies. It is important that the companies trust that what they can share the data, it is done in a trustworthy way and respect their rights. That is why the intermediators are required to employ state-of-art cybersecurity techniques and prevent unauthorized access to data. So the interoperability is important also in the new places, as Internet encompasses the uh, connection of objects, uh, Internet of Things, the interoperability of those objects will become very important. Otherwise, only mega platforms will have structural advantage in offering uh, these objects. So interoperability can play a key role in keeping the markets for physical, but now connected objects open so that the companies and individuals can buy from one company without having to worry about the interoperability of the objects with the other they can buy. This is important in industrial manufacturing and farming, but also in household use. Uh, the Data Governance Act is just the first piece of legislation on the data. We are eagerly waiting commission to propose the Data Act. Uh, it has been now promised to be given in, uh, in early next year. And that will deal also the, the openness and, and, and functioning and the open data flows, what is very much the core of the European Union will. So outside of the data question, I will conclude. Uh, with the following. In line with its values, European Union strongly supports and promotes multi-stakeholder model for the internet governance. No single entity, government, international organization, nor company should seek the control of the internet in practice, neither. So EU should continue to engage in the fora to exchange cooperation and ensure that the protection of the fundamental rights and freedoms notably the right to the dignity, privacy, and freedom of expression and information is the core. Thank you for the possibility to join you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Kumpula Natri. Uh, as you said, you're coming from the country, which is a champion with my data, and uh, you really, in Finland, you walk the talk on discussing this balance in principle between usability of data and protection of data. And few points from your... Uh, uh, introduction are really uh, resonating like uh, we have different types of data therefore we need also to adjust to different type of uh, regulation one question before i uh, invite invite wind to build uh, build on that one question that was raised this morning is very simple question but we may try to answer in the coming uh, coming years the question is why uh, uh, from one uh, one person why we cannot switch our accounts like we can switch uh, our mobile operator 
let's say, social media accounts. With mobile operator, you can move between companies and you carry your number. It was an interesting question, and probably this will be one of the challenges uh, ahead of time, resonating what you discuss, interoperability, the data spaces, and other issues. Wint, uh, you made, uh, with the, uh, together with, uh, with Bob Kahn and the few, you made this possible, the data flow in the packets across the internet. Um, um, are you worried these days uh, about the flow data and more particularly what you can bring us from best practices complementing what we heard about uh, uh, parliamentary or uh, government or um, um, let's say more multilateral uh, perspective on these issues uh, over to you Wint. well thank you so much mr moderator i appreciate the opportunity to engage uh, I have prepared remarks, but I wanted to respond to uh, Ms. Kumpula Natri's uh, observations. First, they were extraordinarily coherent, given that you had such short notice. Uh, and second, you brought up something which I hadn't thought so carefully about, and your point about interoperability, which is key to everything that happens in the internet. But the idea of the data needs to be interoperable, and we have to have standards for that. Uh, to enable uh, effective data flows uh, is really important. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, and the last uh, observation, uh, Jovan, you mentioned that the question that was asked, who do we call when we have problems? We need a cyber fire department uh, and we don't have one yet. So we might ask ourselves, what does that look like? Uh, but let me take a moment now with some prepared remarks to respond to this invitation. In the nearly 40 years that the internet has been in operation and 30 years for the World Wide Web, we've learned a great deal about how powerful computer-aided technology can be. It has enabled great strides in information analysis and sharing, electronic commerce, freedom of expression, and a host of other benefits. We've also learned that such systems can amplify the harmful effects of misinformation, deliberate disinformation, and exploitation of vulnerable people and systems. It's timely to explore the need for and scope of regulatory response to these risks while seeking to preserve the demonstrated value of the open flow of information across the global internet. Private sector actors benefit from clear and common rules and standards for data protection. At the same time, we've learned that digital trade thrives on the free flow of information across borders and enables smaller enterprises to grow to serve global markets. It is increasingly evident that data flows contribute more to GDP growth than even the flow of goods. Thoughtful regulation provides incentives in privacy preserving technologies such as differential privacy or federated learning and provision of extensive privacy protecting controls for users. At Google, we believe that privacy should not be a luxury good. Much of online business is driven by advertising and commitments to e-privacy, GDPR, DSA, and DNA, DMA are vital to that interest. Their further evolution to ensure transparency and user control is worthy of attention. It seems to me important to provide users with access to powerful enabling technologies so that information discovery in the open web can continue to serve them while protecting their privacy. In aid of this, Google is moving away from third-party cookies to improve user privacy, for example. Development of privacy protecting policy or technologies can go hand in hand with regulatory practices to reinforce trust and safety for users of the internet and the World Wide Web. Judicious use of cryptographic methods, for example, have increased privacy protections for all users. Every day, we experience visits from about 20 million users who use their Google privacy, security, and ad settings to manage their data and make choices that are right for them. By way of example, we have developed auto-delete controls that are available over location history, YouTube, and activity data, allowing users to choose how long to save some data in their account. Automatically delete data after three or 18 months. Our password manager automatically protects user passwords across different ac accounts with one click Password checkup tells users if any of your passwords are weak 
whether they've been used for access to multiple sites, or if we've discovered they've been compromised in third-party data breach. Finally, we believe strongly in the value of intermediary liability limitations in support of the free flow of information, free expression, educational opportunities, culture and creativity, and economic growth. Online intermediaries have brought economic growth, freedom of expression, and other societal benefits, and these were made possible by liability regimes that provide broad safe harbors for intermediaries and incentivizes responsibility by offering protections to companies that take additional measures in content moderation. For example, laws like the US Communications Decency Act, Section 230, and the Marco Civil in Brazil treat platforms differently than the author or publisher of the content served, linked, or hosted. Well, I will stop there. I uh, am very much looking forward to a continuing dialogue on this topic, which I consider to be vital to the future utility of the internet and the World Wide Web. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vint, for one uh, probably slip when you said DNA, but I think you uh, uh, send a clear message uh, to our discussion. The, uh, the question of data and privacy is basically DNA. There are many metaphors, blood, uh, oil, but I think DNA is probably one of the, one of the I'm sure it will be tweeted uh, as one of the message. Wint, you uh, uh, develop, uh, develop really this line of discussion built on the Kumpuli uh, uh, Matri uh, parliamentarian on, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Cyberfire uh, Department, which we may discuss, but also question of interoperability, relevance of standards. And one message which was for me particularly relevant was that you said that businesses, they are looking for predictable policy space uh, around standards, around the regulation, which is uh, a, a, a quite, quite clear, but sometimes it is overlooked in the simple dichotomy that governments want to regulate and businesses, they don't want regulation. What type of regulation? This is what we'll discuss today. Now we have a data uh, uh, set. We have a question of dynamics between interoperability, standardization, digital spaces, and you mentioned safe harbor, the, and there is an interesting initiative in Switzerland on digital self-determination, also around the question of data spaces, addressing this question, how to uh, galvanize this dynamic around data while protecting uh, privacy. Therefore, we set the data landscape canvas, and now we move to content. And uh, to see how when data get the meaning, when it becomes the content, what is happening then? Vint, you already tackled that, but let's uh, invite our two uh, speakers today who will reflect on data from their specific experience. Mr. Anton Gorelkin, member of the uh, Parliament of Russian Federation, and uh, Ms. Nick Dad, Dad uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing wrongly your name, Nick, Nick Dad, Executive Director of Digital Rights Foundation. Uh, uh, Mr. Gorelkin, could you tell us more on uh, 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 from your experience and the work of the Russian Parliament on the, this aspect of the regulation and policies on content? Over to you. Let me, dear colleagues, by using the fact that um, I am uh, a MAC member from the Russian Federation, say that uh, Mr. Gorelkin is currently presenting his bill in the Russian uh, uh, parliament in the lower chamber uh, called Stay Duma. And uh, we hope that he uh, joins us a bit later. So we will uh, kindly keep some five minutes for him. And uh, right now, I would just say, uh, let's move on. Sure, sure, Roman. We'll have to uh, wait for metaverse or whatever to be to enable us to be at the uh, different places at the same time. But for time being, we will uh, um, we understand the position. We'll wait for the uh, Mr. Uh, Gorelkin later on. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Nikta Dad, uh, what could you tell us from a civil society perspective? And I would say rich experience in uh, India on the question of uh, content and content policy. 
Thank you, Johan. Um, I'm not from India. I'm from Pakistan. It's really important oh for God. me to make this correction, uh, given the current situation between both countries. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it, I would mean, be, Nita, it would be the biggest blunder of the IGF. I think if there is a blunder list, uh, you should. Uh, it should be on the top. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Go over to you. No, it's 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 perfectly fine. Um, so um, uh, and Johan, I also wanted to. Thank you uh, and Diplo Foundation because I started uh, working on digital rights because I studied uh, internet governance. My first uh, uh, certification back in 2009, uh, sitting in my um, law chamber with a very slow internet uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, and I started, you know, doing this virtual internet governance course. So my work on digital rights basically started from this certification from Diplo Foundation. So I'm really thankful and grateful for the work that you all started. Um, so when it comes to internet regulation, I think it's very important to uh, look into the uh, global south and uh, developing countries. So in the form of uh, internet regulation, in the form of content moderation laws and policies, data protection, like regulation of tech companies and accountability of governments to users is becoming one of the foremost issues of our times, especially uh, when I look at our region, you know, like we, we, we have seen not just in India, in Pakistan, in you know, like in, in Asia Pacific region, in South Asia, there is, uh, you know, this uh, race of uh, regulating internet, I would say rather controlling internet. Um, so lately, there seems to have been a shift towards uh, national governments asserting their regulation uh, over the tech space, online spaces, which has led to concerns and a somewhat fragmented approach towards regulating um, the internet. Um, on the other hand, we are seeing the convergence of uh, approaches as countries are borrowing frameworks from one another. Uh, one prominent example of this is uh, data protection law, uh, the outsized impact of GDPR on jurisdictions well beyond Europe shows how there is often a cascading effect of laws and regulations re related to uh, the internet. Um, Increasingly, uh, regulation is becoming inevitable since the impact of online spaces in areas such as controlling hate speech, online gender-based violence, misinformation and disinformation uh, is increasing every day. But on the other hand, regulation that is badly drafted or doesn't narrowly cover these issues ends up doing more harm than good. And we have seen this in our own jurisdictions. So regulations to regulation to control misinformation or cybercrime has often been vague and broad in its scope, leading to targeting of descendants, journalists, and ordinary citizens. And I'm saying this because of our own experience uh, in our own jurisdiction. Uh, and this misdirected regulation passed as a result of panic about one emerging threat, but used for another has become very common uh, in this region and has led many advocates to become suspicious of any attempts of regulation. So there is also a global north and global south divide when it comes to regulation, since many regulations passed in the north ends up being replicated in other contexts where the rule of law is not as strong as it is strong in, in European countries or UK or US. So the damage these regulations or copycat can do then is immense and needs to be really discussed. And uh, lastly, this imbalance between the North and South really needs to be addressed. You know, when it comes to self-regulatory uh, self approaches, as many developing countries do not have the bargaining power or economic clout to regulate private actors such as tech companies, so this means that there is even less of an incentive uh, for these companies to listen to regulators uh, uh, located in the global south. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikat. Uh, and it's great to hear that you were our student. I hope, I'm sure that you get excellent marks. Whenever I, see, I meet the former students, I'm, I'm worried if, if that person got the good marks. But in your case, I'm sure they were excellent, uh, excellent marks. And uh, what you brought in your uh, discussion is, uh, let's say, uh, one a new shift towards the need for regulation and the question of the having a public authority stepping in uh, with uh, some uh, some risk and also development countries uh, perspective from awareness to 
awareness also parliamentarians, decision makers. And this is the track where, where we need to really invest a lot of time and energy and capacity development across the board. That was echoing a team in this session that I attended this morning. People were asking for more understanding what's going on. And I think your presentation brought good uh, uh, summary on the content aspect. Therefore, we're moving from data to content. Uh, and we may have uh, a few reflections uh, on the on the content uh, policy. Uh, the floor is open. Obviously, the, um, our panelists uh, can uh, can comment on it. Let me uh, see if there is any comment before we move to the AI from uh, uh, Ms. Kumpula Natri or uh, Vinton. What was said so far on the this evolution from data to content and what Nikta basically outline and as a position in the, from the from developing countries. So it, it's Vinton, thank you for an opportunity to intervene again. Uh, first of all, I think that what Gihad had to say is very important because uh, regulation can sometimes fail to do what it is intended to do and, and, and end up being harmful. Uh, but at the same time, having common regulation, it, as I say, from the business point of view is helpful because if it's uniform, uh, then it creates a level playing field for all actors uh, within which uh, they can compete with each other. Uh, I do worry, however, that um, content regulation is hard to do, especially at scale. And uh, that term hasn't come up uh, in the discussion so far. So I want to emphasize that operating at the scale that we and others uh, currently operate at forces us into automated methods for coping with uh, content recognition. And I can tell you that, of course, we try to use machine learning and artificial intelligence, but these are, uh, I will say, brittle tools. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in the, in the third segment of this uh, session. But I, I do want to emphasize that these are imperfect mechanisms for scaling. Uh, and I hope that the regulators uh, and the lawmakers uh, who uh, promote the regulations uh, will appreciate and attend to the difficulty of coping at scale uh, with the content that concerns us. So uh, again, this is going to be um, a process of iterative learning of what works. And it's important, I think, for all of us to share our successes and our failures so that we understand uh, better how to approach some of these problems and whether some of them will function at the scale that we need. That at, at scale, it's another keywords after DNA, which we should uh, focus on. It's basically the right to be forgotten regulation made at Google the biggest juridical body in the world with, I guess, <laughs> something like 1.2 billion uh, million cases processed uh, since it was introduced. And uh, this is an extremely valid point, uh, how, how to cope with that, in this case, 1.2 uh, million with limited possibility of using automated uh, solution. But we'll come back to, uh, to that uh, later on, Wint. Thank you for your intervention and bringing this aspect. Now we'll move uh, 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 trans a smooth transition to AI, data content AI, and we'll bring in discussion also questions, very interesting questions coming from our audience. We will now ask two speakers, Yuta Kroll, she volunteered to reflect on AI and children based on the a recent UNICEF report. But before we ask you to, to speak, let's ask um, uh, Carolina Guerra, co-director of Center for Technology and Society, to build on that line of data, content, and we have now AI. Carolina, over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, evening, everyone. So um, I, I will build upon this and just to say, and uh, Jovan, you just let me know because I was really asked to sort of bring in and chime in with uh, my role in participating uh, in the ad hoc ex expert uh, group uh, for the UNESCO um, recommend recommendations on AI ethics that was approved two weeks ago at the UNESCO General right. Assembly. So, so I you. will leave. I can bracket that and leave it afterwards, and then I can, and maybe I can address now the flow of the conversation that. Um, Need added um, um, and Vint, etc., and Mia Patra were, were raising. So, um, for, for one, I mean, I think that with with AI, I mean, and and Vint just threw this this problem here. Um, <laughs> we have this thing of um, AI addressing content and data, and in in panels, I mean, 
recent panels and participating with experts, I mean, like content and data, for one, it's not a clear division. So AI systems are interfering from a user perspective or are uh, being used by large uh, companies or governments, etc., to filter and monitor content, but that content is actually data. So, um, for one, I think that we are still having, and I don't want to think address this as an ontological debate or about what is data, what is content, <laughs> but but we really uh, maybe have to look more uh, refine a way of thinking about these issues. Uh, maybe um, looking at, uh, for example, the the Data Act of of the European Union, how data is being framed, looking at other examples, but I think we are moving to a level that we really have to, um, if we want to conflate both, just um, be sure what, what we mean by that. And if we want to distinguish data from content, uh, what are the implications of working along those lines? So. Um, that's for one. And then I just want to bring in and not to discuss now the AI ethics uh, document uh, in, in this part of the of the conversation, but um, just to say that interestingly, I mean, with, with they when when they approach me, it's they were really interested in bringing in the experience I had from participating in the internet governance ecosystem. And I think that we have with the internet as a as a general purpose technology and the community that uh, uh, the IGF is still a, 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 a very focal point for the discussions around the internet. We are building these uh, conversations about governance instruments, way of ways of approaching um, um, general purpose technologies such as AI and just to think, is it possible to think about the power and the uh, complexity um, and the ubiquitousness of AI systems if we cannot think about the internet at the same time? So um, we, we, I understand some of the discussions that have been taking place in the IGF in the last years regarding where do we cut the lines between the internet issues and AI, but I also think that we cannot talk about AI without the internet and without data and so uh, we we have to be aware what we what we are thinking about with these terms i'm sorry but i just started hearing myself and that confused me jovan i'm sorry i think you're on mute or we've lost you Sorry for technical issues. I'm sure our colleagues will restore it. Governance, there are specificities of AI governance, but there are so many, so many interplays. Let go. Let us go and hear from Yuta about uh, uh, AI and the children, and then we will uh, will uh, uh, come. To Thank you, Jovan, for giving me the floor on very short notice, but I thought it would be helpful to refer you to the policy guidance on artificial intelligence for children that uh, UNICEF has just published in uh, version 2.0. Um, and they have been in contact with several stakeholders, have done research on the effect uh, that AI will have on children and has already on children. So um, today we face a situation that many, many people uh, are already using services based on AI without having knowledge that this is based on AI. They are using it in their daily life. And even children are, are, are confronted with AI-based services without having knowledge on that. So far, we have nearly no research on how algorithm-based content provision, for example, impacts on child development, especially on early childhood development. Therefore, these policy recommendations that UNICEF has drawn up are very helpful and I would only, they have several, several recommendations. I would only highlight some of these, which are prioritize fairness and non-discrimination for children, which is pretty much in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
especially provide transparency, explainability and accountability for children. So to make people more acquainted and not only the children, but also the adults responsible for children to make them aware, uh, where is AI impacting on their development? And uh, I also would li I like to stress that they recommend to empower governments and businesses with knowledge, knowledge on artificial intelligence and children's rights, which are close to each other. I've had a me meeting yesterday with uh, Commissioner uh, Johansson from DG Connect, uh, from DG Home at the European Commission. And she said, which impressed me very much, the internet should be school, library, and playground for children. And I do think that in all these areas of everyday life, uh, children are now confronted with AI-based services, applications, and so on. And therefore, I would like to emphasize, as you can see from my background, that we should adhere to children's rights in regard of AI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jutta, for uh, bringing the, also this generation aspect. And uh, we should have also chair, virtual chair, or physical in Katowice, where we should have a future generation's empty chair, which we should also think about what would be their interests and their concerns as we are shaping the world that may uh, may uh, have impact on the, their decision and their choices. Therefore, that generation aspect is extremely, extremely valid uh, and useful for our discussion. Thank you for the link. Uh, Wink, you wanted to uh, comment on the question of ethics, which Carolina mentioned, and we'll go after your comment also through the next iteration of comments from all speakers to see how we can bring together all of these nice threads and pieces into, let's say, nice puzzle or mosaic of our session. Over to you, Wint. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that our concerns for ethics should not be confined to artificial intelligence. Generally speaking, software uh, doesn't always work the way it was intended. And we can make the same argument for artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so we should be conscious of an ethical responsibility in creating software-based services uh, not simply confined to the AI and machine learning methods. So my big worry is, uh, for example, that bugs in software are exactly the thing which allow that software to be exploited by hackers, for example, uh, for nefarious purposes. Uh, therefore, I think there is an ethical responsibility for software creators in general, not just machine learning uh, designers to have in mind an ethical uh, posture uh, where not only do we recognize that software has bugs, but that we make sure that A, we test to get rid of them as much as we can before we release. And second, we uh, prepare mechanisms for correcting mistakes in software, which is already propagated, which means having the ability to update the software, which raises a third problem which is how do we know where that update came from and how do we know whether the update itself has integrity? And here, uh, digital signatures can prove to be quite helpful in verifying uh, that, the con that the software update is coming from a good source and has not been modified. So I, I simply want to make the problem harder for the good of all mankind uh, and thank Carolina for drawing attention to it and oh. suggest that we expand our concerns for ethical behavior to full up software production. It's a very, very valid point, and sometimes I'm concerned that the limited okay. policy energy that we have, people involved in this problem, going into just one on one issue. It was blockchain three or four years ago, now is AI and ethics, you know, how it's a fashion in these things. But one should uh, recall that we Basically, law is based on ethics. A law is codification of ethics, uh, and how it's applied is a different question. But it is codification of ethics, and this is where European Union uh, framework made conceptually very interesting breakthrough by saying, let us see what we can apply from existing regulation to AI, and then discuss that small portion about uh, about question of uh, ethics and other issues. Uh, 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 Ms. Kubula Natri, uh, uh, could, uh, uh, could you intervene with your comment uh, on this or any other issue? Over to you. 
Thank you so much. Yes, I happen to be one of the legislators dealing with the AI Act also in the parliament. It was a long uh, political fight. It can be the committees that who and how get the powers, but now it's settled and also my committee will take part. Being also the vice chair for the AI uh, in the Digital Age Special Committee, it is very dear to me that uh, all these discussions. Uh, and rightly so, it's difficult to say what AI, what kind of AI, at what stage, is it different tomorrow, or is it machine learning and so. But then just to clarify for those who are not maybe having the deep dig uh, deep, deep the, on the proposal now on the table from the commission, it is actually quite simple that we do not regulate AI we regulate user cases that the people like children or uh, consumers are facing. We do have some regular trust on the vaccinations, on the medicals, on the services on the market. So the idea is also that when there are AI system on the market, you should have some uh, uh, trust that they are not uh, uh, too high risk. So this is how it is built actually, yes, as, as you rightly Thomas, said, on the existing regulation on the products. It's not that as easy as a toy, is it safe, an uh, elevator, is it safe, but still compare with some like a medical treatment, then you also know that it is that uh, not that easy to regulate, but then yes, we do have some check and control on the products on the market, and when they are AI driven, some transparency needed to be there for the, the trustworthy of the uh, citizens all and all in AI systems. So I look forward to very intensive, interesting next uh, year or two to set this uh, groundbreaking first ever regulation in place in the market of the EU. I'm quite happy to see the other um, ideas evolving in the different places in, in, in the world. So uh, it's not only the ethics, it's also very practical uh, the, what the products on the markets are. Thank you for this opportunity. It is very important and then linked to what uh, Vint uh, sir, uh, said also, the question of ethics of software producer, how to, uh, how to find it and uh, how to ensure that the software is solid before it is uh, released. And also to have some question of externalities, because nowadays uh, failure Colleagues, maybe you can switch on sound now. But we should uh, we should increase definitely ethics across the board, not only in AI, as both you, um, uh, Mia Petra, and uh, Vint highlighted. Vint, you wanted to uh, respond to uh, uh, Amir's question, just for those of you who are not reading the chat. Amir asked whom to call, uh, in that metaphor, whom to call if there is a problem of uh, child online pornography or internet uh, ransomware and other attacks. What is the phone number, Vint? Uh, well, uh, um, Amir uh, lays out a broader uh, statement, I think, than just who to call. He's raising, uh, he or she, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which. Um, excuse me, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, may I jump in and raise my question here? Thank you. Yeah, we, we got your question, uh, Amir, thank you. Uh, uh, Vint is now answering. Oh, thank oh. you, thank you. So uh, I was going to elaborate because uh, Amir's comment uh, is a broad one. It says, look, when crimes occur in a variety of settings, online and offline, uh, and now in the Internet, they can take place across international borders, which was still true in the past. Before Internet, you could commit crimes using the telephone or using the postal service. Uh, the important thing is that you need cooperation across those international boundaries in order to apprehend... Uh, I'm uh, Am I getting an interrupt here? No, no, we, uh, we got it, but now it's the disabled. Uh, would you just mute, uh, gentlemen, it's translator, uh, interpreter for Arabic? I think that was the Arabic interpreter. Yeah. Um, so, to come back to Amir's question, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, has called for a broad digital cooperation initiative. And here, I think, is exactly uh, getting at the problem. 
how do we build uh, confidence and trust and cooperation in law enforcement across international boundaries? How do we arrange for the safe exchange of information? How do we preserve data that might be needed in order to uh, uh, offer testimony in a court of law that's acceptable uh, in, in such settings? There are a wide range of issues to be resolved in order to uh, cope with uh, crimes that, that take place using the internet across international boundaries, let alone in any national setting. So there's still much work to be done uh, to make this uh, a safer environment. Thank you. Thank you, Wint. And uh, we will follow the, what Google is doing so well, having the frontal simplicity of the issues for a search, but uh, uh, building it on complexity of your AI system. Therefore, for citizens, we have to create some sort of simplicity while building on, uh, on what you just outlined um, um, and what Secretary General called for. Uh, and that's the, I'll tell you just one uh, anecdote uh, when I'm trying to explain to my friends, uh, neighbors, what I'm doing. And they uh, got recently uh, uh, very excited by the U uh, European Union call uh, for the standardization use of the USB 3 standard by Apple. Because it affects them when they travel, when they have to charge their mobiles, they don't need to look for uh, different uh, mobiles. Therefore, whenever we can, a look for this type of entry points, this is the best awareness building. And uh, what you just explained and what uh, Amir asked about uh, whom to call for the, in the case of digital attacks. We have now all building, uh, building blocks uh, from data to via content and artificial intelligence, including, I would say, a rather important discussion of interplays, how the data uh, feeds into content and ultimately to artificial intelligence. Before we move to the next round on the comments, which would be more comments of knitting, getting these threads together into something uh, which can come out of our session, I would just like to go quickly through the chat session because this is very important. If we ask colleagues to contribute, Nothing should be ignored uh, and not reported. We had a question from Madagascar for Wint, and Wint already answered about uh, password, strength of password and data protection and uh, privacy, how to keep it uh, away from uh, hackers. We have a question from Ursula Marcevic on the, uh, some system that uh, Ursula is developing, uh, which supports uh, GDP uh, and SDGs and 2030 agenda, and she shared the link uh, to WIPO document. Thank you, Ursula, for contributing to that. Uh, uh, then we had also comment uh, from, oh, this was a comment for me personally. There are quite some students, my former students in the room. I'm very proud of them. And uh, you have also a link from uh, Utah about uh, European, uh, about UNICEF uh, uh, new guidelines. And then we have from Timea Suto uh, a quick update from the room. We are having technical issue connecting audio to the interpretation rooms. Colleagues are working on troubleshooting. Uh, Timea, uh, should we do something or we just continue? Please advise us. You, or you just explain us what is happening or we should do something to solve this problem? Oh, okay. I'm okay. sure it's, it's Vint. I'm sure they're working as hard as they can to solve it. Uh, I, they wanted to acknowledge it publicly because some people in the okay. chat were asking what to do. Sure. Uh, and we have another, uh, you know, Roman says, uh, please carry on. Uh, and uh, I see that Yik Chan uh, Chin yes. has a question. So let's uh, find out what that is. Yik Chan Chin has a question. And the uh, question, uh, yeah, uh, please go ahead, Yik Chan Chin. Okay, thank you. I think my question is more broadly, and the broader question may, people may not answer, have enough time to answer now. But it's about, uh, so I, I think I, I agree with Vincent about uh, we need a global standard, you know, and uh, global collaboration. But uh, as we see, there's so many original uh, negotiation the treaty uh, have been signed at the moment, uh, even uh, regional alliance, you know, like a UK, UAE's uh, High Technical Council, and uh, the, GT, the G7 uh, trade, digital trade principles, 
and then they have a transatlantic uh, agreement. So we see so many different agreements. So my question is, where is the central authority? You know? So who is, uh, which one is the central organization or central authority should be responsible for coordinating all these uh, different uh, initiatives? Should o UN be the ultimate central authorities or central institutions? Can it be? Because there are so many problems about the UN. Yeah, that's a big question. Thank you. Thank you, Yuchan Chin. I can see Wind raised his hand. Wind, go ahead. To, uh, trying to solve the entire problem ahead of time and then instituting a practice. Uh, we learned this lesson in the development of the internet because we iterated four times on the protocol design before we were satisfied that we thought it would work. So, so you're quite right. There are many different proposals on the table. I wonder if there's a way to try some of them out, whether it's bilateral or multilateral, uh, in order to see whether they can be made to work and also to expose uh, reasons why they might not work. Uh, before we try to come to some common uh, practice, uh, perhaps we need to test these ideas first. Sure. Thank you, Wint. We are having now the, the new dynamics in the cybercrime that we may have in four or five years' time, two conventions. And we forget also that uh, our telecommunication infrastructure is regulated by to ITR, International Telecommunication Regulation, one adopted in uh, in Dubai and the other from Melbourne from the 1988. But fortunately, differences are rather minor. Therefore, we we don't uh, we communicate not normally via Zoom uh, this thing. But that's a problem uh, is going to raise, uh, especially when we start having regulation of specific areas like data health e-commerce, which is accelerating. We are noticing it in Geneva, it is accelerating. And that can increase potential overlap and uh, confusion. And probably this is this is one of the most uh, difficult and demanding questions ahead of us. We have now the uh, quick question from uh, our colleagues in Dhaka, Bangladesh, from the hub, and then we will move for, for the few questions in the chat. Over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for allowing Dhaka Bangladesh New Hub to ask the question. Our question that how artificial intelligence can work for rural developed country where internet is so rare. Your question, could you repeat? Uh, our question that how artificial intelligence can work for rural developed country where internet is so rare. Thank you very much. It's, I think it's extremely important question and we will ask our panelists, uh, uh, whoever uh, can uh, pick up the uh, question, uh, maybe, maybe Nihad from, the, from your background in, uh, in, the, in the region and in the uh, wider region, that could be interesting to hear. But we have now to sort one big problem. This is a problem of the hybrid meetings. And it seems that we online uh, managed to uh, uh, overtake the conversation and people who are in Katowice, who made an effort to come to Katowice, are complaining that they cannot uh, ask the question. Now, uh, uh, Vittorio, it's great to see you, uh, to see you. Uh, that's, uh, let's solve this challenge of hybrid meetings. This is, we need one session, how to make a real equal participation. Usually, online participation is less equal, but in this case, it seems that it is... Okay, over to you, uh, 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 Vittorio, uh, in whatever way, and then we will ask uh, the, the answer for the question from colleagues from, uh, uh, from uh, Bangladesh. You use a microphone or you use, you use your notebook and the Zoom, whatever. No, it seems no, no, hello. <laughs> I actually have to Go speak ahead. into the laptop in the room. It's interesting, but thanks for sorting this out. No, actually, my uh, my question was related to the point on interoperability, which was uh, originally one, uh, possibly the main point of the session. 
because I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, regulation around the world, especially in Europe, since I'm European, trying to up uphold the, the principle of interoperability, which is one of the original key principles around the architecture of the internet. Uh, the problem we have now is that the, sometimes there are I mean, governments that are going against this. Sometimes there are also the, the big tech companies that are going around this. So I, I would like to, to get a comment um, I mean, from, from whoever wants on the panel on uh, how can we get out of this uh, current situation of uh, walled gardens everywhere in which uh, I mean, many dominant companies are building services in ways that are not interoperable and they are integrating their services one with the other so that it, there's no way for third parties to provide alternatives and uh, which in theory would be the point of ensuring interoperable and open standards for the internet. So if, if anyone has comments on that, thank you. Great. Definitely, this is the crucial question. I'm sure the wind and the, and the merit. Uh, and this question you had, when you hear the AI, uh, this big uh, latest technology, and what uh, our colleague from uh, Bangladesh said, well, we have a problem with access to the internet. How would you uh, reconcile these two uh, dynamics? Yeah, um, so I also wanted to comment when uh, uh, colleagues were talking about ethics around AI, and I feel that, you know, developing ethical principles around AI is not, is not sufficient only. We really need to see, you know, how, who is basically training these AIs, you know, when we talk about big tech giants, for instance. We, do we see really the diversity? Do we see who are, who are these people? Is it like a white man sitting in a Silicon Valley? or somewhere in Europe developing these AI for women sitting in Pakistan or, or Bangladesh. So you see, we really need to see the structural and basic problem when, you know, when, when it comes to developing AIs. Uh, and so developing principle is one thing, but I think we need to look at the, you know, design and, and structure. And I, and I feel that we are really not, uh, we discuss this every single time, but we are really not addressing the problem when it comes to diversity or who are the people designing the these AI, or are we really looking into training these AIs time and again? And I think that's, and I'm coming from a perspective of, you know, online gender-based violence, for instance, uh, in Pakistan or in India or in Bangladesh, where, you know, in when women or marginalized communities face uh, online violence uh, in different languages, you know, the social media platforms do not, their AIs do not even recognize uh, that uh, kind of hate speech or, or harassment or rape threats that's, uh, that they receive, the women receive or the marginalized communities receive in their local languages. So I think there is like a problem of uh, not just looking into the structural issue around AI, but also how much resources these big tech giants are putting into you know developing and training these AIs so that's one thing but I also I'm not sure how is the situation in Bangladesh but speaking from Pakistani perspective I feel that we are not even there to discuss you know uh, uh, AI that uh, when it comes to you know uh, the advancement of these uh, conversations um, I'm discussing this in the in IGF, but I don't think that I have gotten a chance to discuss this nationally or locally. So the conversations are not even there. We are still, uh, you know, uh, um, discussing gender digital divide. Who has access to internet? Who doesn't have access to internet? Internet shutdowns, internet censorship, internet regulations, which are basically not really to address the issues of that we have discussed here, but to regulate content or, or, or uh, shut down dissent. So I think we really need to uh, see, are we taking along all these countries in these conversation? You know, I don't think so. We are behind these conversations, and if conversations or, uh, or narratives are not there, then we are not even, you know, like, uh, I don't know how we are going to look into the universal solution or come to the point where, you know, the principles can be developed, where all the all the countries from global north to global south are following those principles. Great points, Nikhat. Uh that's that's exactly what is the core in core in this some debates like AI and ethics, which is, for example, very important debate here in Vatican. Vatican has been discussing it for 20 centuries and other churches. There were people from the other denomination. But when it comes to the, the nitty gritty and sort of a question of access, question of gender violence, that's probably something where I guess 
people in the South would uh, uh, invest more of their policy energy and time into uh, uh, fixing these issues. I think we should be very, very aware of that. And thank you for bringing that uh, that element. Uh, one solution that can bridge uh, between your and uh, uh, Vittorio's question is the question of standards. Uh, to what extent the standards, uh, instead of just the general discussion of ethics, to what extent standards can help us to deal with interoperability, what uh, uh, Vittorio was referring to, or uh, to deal uh, with, uh, with the question of AI. And that's probably the next step, because we have regulation laws that we can accept, but there is some sort of uneasiness, especially in dealing with unknown developments to regulate them heavily. Although Vint hinted to one interesting point to have some sort of policy sandbox to try to see if it works, if it doesn't work, to get feedback and to move on. But standards are emerging as an interesting area for the policy making. Could I have a comment on this Vittorio's question uh, from uh, anyone at our panel? Um, um, how uh, Vittorio pointed basically how we can move from the words, from the rhetorics into real interoperability. Uh, what is the position of uh, uh, governments? What, uh, what is the position of tech companies? And uh, can we walk the talk? Uh, it's open uh, for uh, all of our panelists. Uh, Carolina, you were uh, relatively quiet uh, yeah, after your uh, great initial in intervention. Would you like to take on this point, maybe bringing also standards and AI in discussion, and then we'll ask other panelists to join. So, um, I, I mean, Vittorio raised a super uh, mega relevant issue, um, which uh, I think that in terms of the uh, interoperability debate uh, in the uh, core of the internet uh, standards, uh, we, I mean, there's, there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> best practices uh, that that we can take from there but we ha we also uh, have to acknowledge that, that there are other uh, initiatives that are trying even to sort of for me one of the most relevant and and uh, important successes of of the internet and this is open end-to-end uh, um, -end, uh, interoperable internet that we have uh, managed uh, through um, people with like Vint and, and uh, the TCPIP protocol suite and the following organizations, there's exemplary uh, cases of how this uh, has been uh, put forward. And, and yesterday I was participating at this um, uh, report uh, regarding the internet's technical success factors and and there is some evidence that this end-to-end -end interoperable uh, layered internet is very much uh, alive and kicking but but there's the the elephant in the room which Vittorio just raised and it's how is uh, how are we going to address this uh, with the I mean the this CDNs and the concentration of large players and the uh, uh, internet uh, infrastructure layer as well and and I'm, I'm bringing in another topic it's not data but it's data that is driving dri driving those models and this connects with AI and 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 how data feeds into this AI models but I think there's this uh, very very delicate uh, ch governance challenge around um, interoperability and security that uh, that it's, um, I mean, if we want this interoperable data systems at the platform layer and it's uh, working with uh, users' data, uh, we really have to tread carefully. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's it's a very valid ask to be to be a concern, but we also have to uh, think about what, how we are going to work with that. And I really think that we, we need to sort of not just think top down, but also work from the communities and not just communities that are in the global north developing these technologies, but also in more peripheral communities. We go, thank you, thank you, Caroline. Uh, we go back quickly to the online uh, online chat and see what's going on in online chat. And then we will get back to the panelists to develop further on the, this uh, Vittorio and other questions to create a closure in our discussion. Uh, then there was a question of uh, uh, Chris and, uh, and uh, Yik uh, Chan Chin uh, on the sort of uh, UN and the uh, role of the UN, uh, uh, Chris mentioned, but UN can cover a pretty wide range of venues and modalities these days. And uh, well, this is what is the, in the sort of a TOR of the UN. And this is an interesting development as digital is less and less specific, uh, digital 
it, we have now digital health or e-commerce, but soon it will be just become health and commerce and uh, human rights. And that transition, I'm not sure how the IGF community will adjust to that tradition. That will be a big tradition. Suddenly, with, which was exclusive domain of what we were discussing, becomes basically a general topic. And then Yiki uh, Chin Chin mentioned the General Secretary IGF Plus process. We have a comment from Wolfgang. Great, Wolfgang, to have you here about IGF Plus. Is the key way to stumble forward, take a good song forum and make it better? And then Yuta uh, uh, couldn't agree more with uh, Nihad, uh, what she said about the vulnerable and marginalized group. Support for Nihad uh, all over the place, great. And then we had uh, from Chris uh, also comment on the evolution uh, of uh, IGF is going in the context of going, going to work in other UN spaces, cybersecurity, cybercrime. IG evolution needs to continue to define and strengthen IGF uh, IGF's role in relation to those uh, efforts. I think it's a key issue, Chris, definitely. What is the new uh, sort of, it's in a way, soul searching for IGF, new role for IGF uh, in this fast changing environment. And then we have a uh, Caroline, uh, digital trade is also on table with other developments and exchange. And uh, of Volgan brought you and Human Rights Council, I love by very rich, uh, uh, seen. Uh, Amir, you had one comment, uh, you can type it, uh, type another question, but let's now, since we are, we have about five minutes to wrap up, and we, we did online coup d'etat. I don't know what's going on in C2. I hope uh, there are people people in the room, they didn't give up on our, uh, on our sort of uh, online uh, dynamics. Here is a specific question from Amir for Wint. My question to dear Mr. Vincent is that some problems in internet like crime and cyber attacks could be solved in the architecture and technical level by initiatives like security by design, safety by design, uh, and an anonymity issue to facilitate law enforcement with aim of preventing and combating cyber crime and harmful activities in digital space. It is a crucial issue. I'll share with you in a minute the link to the paper which I prepare for this interreligious dialogue discussion on the digital future, trying to explain to non-IG people what is going on. And one of the issues in discussion was uh, we had a very strong blockchain community, uh, which was almost religious, I would say, uh, trying to argue that blockchain is a solution for all problems. And it made an interesting discussion how far you can go with by design solutions. And one example is a Tor and Dark Web. Tor was developed for legitimate purposes to anonymize access of people who can be uh, punished for uh, what they're saying. But then uh, it became a sort of a space also for the dark web, and we know what's happening, what were misuses of Tor. Therefore, one has to be careful uh, with the complete by design solution, but it would be great in the final uh, wrap-up statements to comment on the, this question or any other question from our great panelists. You were really fantastic. Uh, we start with the European Parliament, and uh, then uh, you can uh, pick up on any of these points. Maybe uh, close a few threads. Therefore, we have a nice, nice sort of um, um, uh, chilly. We have the nice uh, setup towards the end of the session. Please go ahead. Thank you. I loved the discussion. Really, the best of the IGF, uh, even not physically there. To uh, a friend from Bangladesh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get all the names. AI for the rural development regions. It is so important, and things actually. One, the Yixiangxing also mentioned the the UN system and took forward some of those many. But then, really, the goal for the our common agenda and digital compact now by the Secretary General, they go for the connectivity, connectivity, and connectivity, and also AI development, uh, inclusivity, and others. But then really, really to see once we have every corner, every person connected and online, there is also more tools to continue. And of course, uh, AI solutions needs to link with the countryside for the agricultural crisis, more that it comes with the uh, climate change and so on and so on. So also the ITU, uh, UNESCO, GIGA for the every school connected. Once school, schools are connected, there are more, more connection for the neighboring region. So it's very important. Thank you for taking this up. For the Victoria, I think uh, I tried to elaborate in my speech. 
that how to uh, avoid the world, world gardens. It is really not the way for the, uh, uh, the interoperability uh, anymore being the key if we uh, accept this kind of development. And thank you for the Pakistan, the diversity uh, the, on the design structures. It is actually something that we also should uh, try to soft regulate. If it, is it's a little bit difficult to say the quota for every single company having the, the group of engineers. I happen to be a woman en engineer myself, but then uh, setting that on the hard legislative uh, way, but it is the soft we need to do. And actually European Parliament will next Monday have in, on its plenary the uh, discussion on the online violence against the, the on the gender basis. So this is us a humankind together and we cannot accept the raising up the hands and say we cannot uh, act. We have to and we will. But as long as the criteria for the uh, social media platforms is that the time we use online and then the every second we be there, it's hard to have any kind of uh, avoiding these. So we, we need to work with the companies and try to set rules there as well. So let me conclude my part. I believe that the new corporate responsibility is not anymore the climate alone, but it, is, it should be also the responsible use of data. And it actually also, the CO2 is so little, we don't see it, but everybody knows uh, how to govern it. We have the uh, climate agreements and we talk about something uh, intangible CO2. And I think it's the same with the data units. We don't see it and we say, see how it structures the world. So we need to have some good governance for that. Thank you for being able to be a part of your Thank session you. today. Thank you, Mia Petri. It was a great comment. And one of you, um, our colleagues in chat may, may answer this question. At what point we will have a, this situation that we can shift from, I don't know, Telegram to WhatsApp, but not only our data, which is portabilities, but also our network with us as we are doing with our mobile phones. What will be that point? Uh, and it would be, I would say, if I can use this term, holy grail of interoperability to have the real possibility to switch and move between uh, platforms. Uh, thank you, uh, Mia, Pet Mia Petr, for uh, your uh, great work and uh, I think excellent... Is, uh, the, the short answer is... Yes, in, go the ahead. Interoperator, in the, yeah, interoperators uh, in this DGA, they have the label of trustworthy interoperator as far as they also can have uh, uh, interoperability and that's where the innovation board is now helping to create them uh, when they go for the sectoral data spaces so that the lock-in would be uh, avoided already in the planning phase. That's the dream. Let's see if we get meet around the bones as the bones are the legislation, now the soft uh, um, infrastructure to be built and companies to get on. That's Maybe the European you trial. You may copy, you may not. <laughs> Maybe also to, to uh, supplement that with the standards. That would be interesting uh, also to sub supplement that. Standard will be part of the uh, uh, Yes. Wint, what, uh, what you were, you, we haven't heard from you the last um, um, uh, 20 minutes. What would be your uh, sort of echoing point from this discussion and uh, how would you bring it uh, uh, together to some sort of uh, closure? Uh, well, that's very difficult given the scope of the discussion. But I, the thing which um, I think is most apparent to me anyway is that we should bring to this discussion a certain degree of humility. This is an extremely complex environment. Just to give you an example, the idea about security for design, yes, you may be able to uh, achieve that objective for a particular piece of software that you're developing, but think for a moment about the internet environment. Billions of devices with who knows what software in them are interacting across the network, some of them for the first time. Who knows what the consequences of that interaction is going to be? I think we should be a little humble about imagining that we know how to solve all of these problems. This is not an excuse to avoid working on them. I absolutely want to work on them. Uh, one other point, I mentioned scale earlier. It had to do with the amount of content that the online providers have to cope with. There's another scale problem associated with machine learning, and that's the amount of information that is needed in order to successfully train 
a machine learning model. And if you're saying, I want to automatically detect harassment and other harmful speech, it, 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 the techniques that we currently have require huge amounts of that bad language in order to train the system. There, there's, there's something kind of unnerving about that observation. So let me uh, back up a little bit and try to summarize. Uh, we clearly need rules and regulations that work. We want them to be as uniform and as globally applicable as possible. I would urge us to remember that our first attempts and our second attempts and even our third attempts may not work. So let us learn from our attempts. Let us try things out and iterate and not attempt to solve the entire problem with our very first piece of law. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the continued effort of many to create a safer and more secure internet environment for everyone. Thank you, Wint. I think that's the best possible summary of our discussion. If, uh, if other panelists, especially Karolina and Nihat, uh, agree, we can uh, close on this note and uh, message of humility uh, agile approach to test things uh, and uh, not to shy away from the problems, but to to uh, approach them with the utmost humility and um, wisdom and innovation. And for those of you who are based in, uh, who are physically in uh, Katowice, I'm sending message from the place, uh, and you may visit the place uh, in near Katowice. The name is Nova Huta where Papa Wojtyla was, uh, was a priest before he became a pope. And this is one link, a physical link between uh, where I'm now and, uh, and the Katowice where the meeting is happening. This is the look uh, from my <laughs> room, hotel room. Thank you very much for the great, uh, for me, inspiring discussion. Um, uh, for uh, all of your... Uh, Tolerance with all mistakes I made, especially Nihat, uh, with uh, introducing you. Uh, you, uh, that was, I had a fun. This is the most important. It uh, uh, kicked off quite a few synapses uh, in, the, um, in my IG part of the brain to think of the things that I didn't think before. I hope that uh, panelists enjoyed it equally, and especially our audience, both online and uh, in situ. Thank you very much. All the best. And thank for you and bye. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much. And for everyone here in the thank room, you. thank you very much again for bearing with us through the technical difficulties and for listening to the conversation and following us online as well. We really, <laughs> really appreciate you being here and following the session. If anybody has anything to contribute more, feel free to use the IGF hashtags um, and reach out to us. Thanks again, everyone. Technicians, you are the best guys. Thank you very much. You spoiled the main discussion.